Welcome to the Petro Papers podcast. Say that 10 times fast. This is where you get your oil and gas intellectual stimulation by asking the technical questions. I'm Yogoshri Pradhan, and with me here today, I have Hong Ji Zhang from University Lands. Today, we're going to talk about paper 203935, and the paper title and the description is written in the description box for the podcast and for the description box for the viewers on YouTube. I'm going to introduce Hongji a little bit before we get, before I start peppering him with questions. He's a senior engineering advisor in production enhancement at University Lands. He's also serving as an adjunct professor at Texas A&M University. He also served as a global reservoir engineering advisor for ConocoPhillips. Hongji has a PhD in petroleum engineering at Texas A&M University and he has a bachelor's and a master's degree from the Southwest in Petroleum Engineering from the Southwest Petroleum University of China. He has authored and co-authored over 50 technical papers. Welcome to the podcast, Hongji. Thank you, Yushi. Thank you for the uh, interest in the paper. Awesome. I thought before we get started with asking you questions on the paper, could you brief our viewers and listeners a little bit on university lands, especially if they're not from Texas? Okay, all right, thank you. So uh, university lands is a <clears throat> mineral rights management company. University land manage about uh, over 2 million acres of land in the West of Texas. So the income, like royalty income from the surface, from underground, like oil and gas development, all this revenue goes to <clears throat> a fund called the PAF Fund, Permanent University Fund, which support those two big university systems in Texas, UT system and the Texas A&M systems. So over years, uh, since uh, oil and the gas being produced in, since 1930s, so it has been uh, uh, collected lots of royalty for the pop fund. Last year, in the uh, fiscal year 2021, we have collected about almost one billion, with B, one billion dollars royalty for the fund. So that's all we do. We have a, a we have a team uh, less than seventy people, including from technical, very technical to lawyer to landman to cashier, etc. So it's like a, a operator, but we are watching the data, watching the revenue income, trying to figure out the, the technical trends and uh, trying to study the best practices and share with the operators. Therefore, to stimulate more oil and gas. Uh, activities uh, to enhance the venue or collect more royalty for the pop fund. That's all we do. Awesome. I've had the privilege to work for the university lands for a couple years and it's, it's been a very exciting experience and it's in, so crazy to know about 70 people managing about 2.1 million acres monitoring all of that uh, production as well as the, the revenue that that benefits the UT and Texas A&M schools. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, Hongji, I was thinking that before I start peppering you with questions, if you could familiarize our viewers and listeners on the, on the paper that was recently presented at the Reservoir Simulation Conference at 203935. So the, this is the... Uh... Something uh, the paper was worries about the uh, something we have been working on for many years, and the paper is really trying to document the uh, the motivation, the results, and what we and why we did something to uh, uh, to speed up the uh, history match for the uh, hydraulic fractured wells or reservoirs. So the, you know, over years, the, um, we found out that whenever we try to uh, history match or calibrate, calibrate a model for the well performance uh, with hydraulic fracturing, it's a little bit hard. Sometimes, as you know, it's a try and error. 
uh, way. And when for this unconventional reservoir development with a horizontal well, with a multi-stage hydraulic fracturing treatments, and then the uh, fracture network becomes so complicated. And then uh, every single time we have a model is one million sales or one model we had is over 10 million sales. So we found out it's so hard to find a, a model so robust, not only calibrate its history, and also the forecast for the future uh, forecast. So then we, we, tried, we tried many different ways. We finally found something which is very interesting. So then we document that way to, uh, to, 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 to the, the things we did and how we did and uh, the workflow, the uh, correlations or anything we share with uh, the uh, readers. Awesome. Yeah, I was really excited when I read the paper because I've been following a lot of the university lands work and the publications and seeing this one at the simulation conference this is definitely a hot topic in terms of determining the fracture closure, determining the permeability changes from the fracture closures as well. So I, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, <clears throat> uh, traditionally, we, uh, in, especially from the production history uh, uh, data analysis mm -hmm. or reservoir simulation history match standpoint of view, as I know, we, I always use a single fracture effective lens in the model and forever. We try like 100 feet, 150 feet or 100 whatever feet so that we can match the uh, history. So that we say, oh, this is good, that is uh, the thing. But in the modeling process for that way, we assumed that the fracture conductivity is the uniform along the fracture length. And the fracture may never reduce the length, it just reduce the conductivity because we use a very uh, traditional uh, monotonic mm -hmm. uh, relationship between stress and permeability, which was uh, documented by uh, Wash in the early 90, early 80s, I think. So that is always the way we did, but the gaming current completion is so complicated the, uh, also, we use uh, so many different, uh, like, I mean, so much propon, but the propon concentration is so little, but we try to, to, to uh, create, a, create as many uh, fractures as possible, or as large as possible, then therefore the fractures concentration distribution within fractures, I mean, becomes so complicated. It's, it's hard to find one, uh, one way one a certain a fixed fracture lens to, to to get a result. You may be able to to do that for a moment, but after three months or one year production, whoops, you may find a different thing. That's really the one of the example I, I showed there is the uh, in the uh, paper is the figure three and the figure four. So this just demonstrates the concept. In the I can use a longer fracture as demonstrated in the figure three. Like that one is 150 feet to match the history very well. You can see the curves of production history match very well with a total liquid control to bottom of pressure match almost perfectly. However, if you keep going and then you find the model deviated from the production history. Now the figure four shows that other way. Okay, let's see. We know fraction halfness reduced with time with depletion. But the uh, figure four just demonstrated if I short the fracture to 135 feet, it matched pretty well for the major production from like 400, like 500 days to uh, 700 days. But it did not do anything good or as cl even close to the reality in the early production uh, period of time from zero to about 400 days. So therefore we know that the, the, the fracture halfness reduced with time with depletion, but uh, in the reality, you may do two ways. In the simulation side, you say every single time step, you can stop and insert a new correlation. You say, here's my fracture halfness reduced 10 feet, but it's just a, a trial and error guessing work. So that's the reality. Nice. No, thanks for that explanation. Now I wanted to 
talk a little bit about just, I've been thinking about the paper and how you started the paper and you displayed like the closure stresses between white sand and, and silica. I was curious to know that even with those closure stresses, have you reviewed the economics with the incremental production coming from white sand? Maybe that extra cost will pay out and yield a higher IRR? Now for this uh, paper or this study, we did not uh, do that. We didn't, or we did not document that in this paper, but I think uh, everyone could find uh, some documentation in the public domain to say, yes, the uh, white sand, uh, or somebody mentioned it, white sand may provide a more uh, uniform consistency and a stronger, uh, better conductivity, uh, endurance with the stress, uh, but also is the cost is a, a bigger issue. Now here in the, uh, in the um, my personal opinion is this, in the unconventional reservoir, because the permeability is so low in the nano darcy, let's say 100, 200, 300 nano darcy, if we follow the reservoir engineering uh, principle, whenever the dimension is conductivity factor more than 30 or 100, you do not need more uh, conductivity anymore because that moment, whenever the dimension is conductivity factor more than 30 or 100, it becomes like an infinity of conductivity. You do not need more uh, conductivity anymore. Therefore, it's whatever the, 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 the sand or propon we can find out and pump into the formation, that's what we need. I think that's maybe it's a little bit out of the topic, but it's one of the yeah. things why industry use the 100 mesh sand and also local. It's basically services to purpose. Enough conductivity and it's cheap. Awesome. And I know from the previous question, you talked about the Washburn paper, so I'll be sure to cite that as well in the description in, our, in, the, in the podcast on the YouTube video so people can also look at that reference. On, uh, on fracture connectivity and fracture closure. When I noticed about the stress-dependent equation that you introduced, well, you introduced and it's, it's well known, but I was curious to know how can one obtain the stress sensitivity coefficient and the effective stress coefficient from the common stress-dependent perm equation? That's a very good question, but it also is, <laughs> it's very tough. <laughs> ideally, ideally, uh, you know, the, uh, when the WASH document that the, uh, I mean, develop his equation, for that is really trying to uh, mimic the uh, reservoir matrix rock, the rock itself shrinking or being compressed by stress. So from that standpoint of view, you could use the uh, laboratory, get a core that core or core and do a series of tests, see what is the permeability change with a different stress. So therefore you can, from that correlation, you get the direct measurement. That's the ideal way. Now in the underground, it could be a little bit different because we have so many different layers. I mean, different rock uh, mythology change by like, like a clay content, et cetera, or the content of the carbolase, et cetera, that will impact on this, uh, uh, the uh, rock itself shrinking with the uh, stress. Now the concept here is really on the other side is about the uh, propon itself. We focus more on the propon. We do not think that much on the stress on the matrix itself, but on the propon. So then we have some idea from the uh, laboratory data on the uh, different propon uh, stress strains or conductivity test with, uh, stre with uh, stress. So the paper actually uh, document a few uh, conductivity data set from the different sources. You can, uh, the readers or everyone can go there to see it. So therefore from there, if you pumping a very same problem and if it happens, you have the uh, stress uh, and the conductivity test data set, you can use that for your, uh, for your uh, correlation parameters there. The only trick is this one because the proton conductivity also is a, a function of the proton concentration. 
So actually, uh, the the paper actually I bought is those two uh, two charts. One is the demonstrated in the figure eleven. Another one is the uh, figure twelve. So those are the real test data set. We're trying to see is that in the, when the propound in the very uh, little concentration, when the propound form a partial monolayer, at that moment, without stress chain, that can provide the highest conductivity compared to the other concentration. But uh, however, with the stress change, with apply a little bit of stress, then the conductivity with monolayer or partially monolayer uh, uh, fracture, the conductivity reduces dr dramatically with stress, increase in stress. So therefore, but we kind of watch that, so that especially in this unconventional reservoir, we see very big high rate with a very flush high production rate from wells. I think person that's main thing is due to that. A large area with a monolayer or little propound conductivity is so high, and then it got a loss of the contribution from reservoir. We have a loss of high productivity, I mean, uh, high rate. Once the stress changes and getting higher and higher, then you have less conductivity. Your monolayer or partial monolayer layers may shrink or disappear, dismiss. I mean, there's nothing left. So the fracture close. Therefore, your conduct and production decreases so fast. That's the thing we have to keep mind in, in there. So therefore, this is really one of the things why we did the way uh, in the, uh, the main uh, idea is based upon the, in the paper figure number eight is best, basically trying to illustrate the idea. We know the along the fracture, the propon concentration vary a lot. We typically have a highest concentration near well bore. We have a little concentration in the fracture tip. So that's, but when the uh, stress getting higher and higher during the depletion, the little one, little concentration propon area, property the fracture area will be closing with uh, depletion mm -hmm. or disappear very fast, depend on the other factors how fast you can, uh, you are depleted or how fast your drawdown is. And I also depend on the rock mechanics too. Uh, it's uh, heavily depends on the rock Young's modules. So here is the thing, if the if rock is very soft, the, there's something you apply a little bit of stress. This propon will embed into the rock itself, disappear like next second. So that's why we see some rocks, especially in the, with high clay or some rocks in the Eagle for you see the uh, Young's modules only less than two million PSI. Mm -hmm. the, for that moment, the, the, the embedment is very serious. On the other hand, if your uh, rock is very more like a carbonate, which has very high Young's modules, like eight million PSI. If you draw down, you open your chalk very big, you draw down very fast, it's going to crash your propon mm -hmm. very seriously. Your uh, I mean, the conductivity diminish very fast. You also have lost the uh, fracture length too. So this is really the in the figure eight is trying to uh, demonstrate the the thought about that. So with that, we kind of thinking about this in the uh, uh, reality. The propon concentration just is vary with uh, fracture length or with area. So therefore we can uh, document it, uh, kind of follow a similar idea from wash the uh, equation. We say, why not we demonstrate use a different re uh, region or area? Trying to say this area with a very little propon, we use this uh, correlation, I mean, different uh, coefficients, basically same equation, but different co coefficients. But with uh, the more, uh, with different uh, concentration of the, uh, region by, I mean, by uh, divided the area, fracture area by proper the concentration area, then we apply different coefficient. Therefore, we're trying to say, okay, that might be able to mimic the process of the fracture closure during the depletion. So you, we, we, for those two cases uh, uh, documented in the paper, 
we illustrated that we uh, we use this like five different uh, propound mm -hmm. concentration regime regions to use five different correlations to uh, to for the in the history match we found out a very well behaved model even one of the cases i'm not quite sure is this and in the case number two actually we we document that production data once we uh, sorry case number one. one we need a with, with like uh, we use one year about a one year data to calibrate the model with this approach and then we use like another one and a half years production data to back test the calibrate model it behaved very well it may not be a document uh, showing this paper but we found out that in, the, in this year's uh, exercise we found okay now we have more production data we just dump into the, uh, the the data into the model to test the model if the model behaved well or not. It turned out to behave very well. So we have uh, some confidence about this approach or very confident about this approach to uh, for the uh, robust of the model. And I also found out it's, it's much faster. And the, the, the beauty of that is that we do not have to try different things, try this uh, correlation uh, one time and try another correlation one time and try 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 an error. That would, it was we uh, we had been doing before this uh, kind of approach uh, being uh, applied, but it was slow. Right now we found out this uh, this way it really speed up our uh, simulation history match process a lot. Awesome. No, thanks for explaining about how we can get the stress sensitivity coefficient. Definitely relative to the area or relative differences between different areas in how the fracture closure is, is, is different. I wanted to pivot to one of the explanations of the workflow and the inputs of fracture half lengths, for, for instance, that was used for the history match. For the fracture half length that was used in the history match, are those fracture half lengths hydraulic or conductive? So they are in the uh, traditionally it should be uh, or personally I used as the effective fracture length or half length is basically with assuming there's problem there. So that's the traditional way. They always use the effective uh, fracture half length in the traditional model. So it's, yeah, it's, it's effective. So it could be a contribution hydraulically or a contribution from, from the conductive. Yes, yeah. there's a need to be the tweak over there too. You said, now there's a something that in the industry, the people you say, well, my fracture, uh, even though I may not have the uh, problem there, but because my rock shifts a little bit, the rock surface is not very smooth. Those are kind of rough list or point maybe extra support the fracture a little bit. Uh, so that it could be behaving like an effect, effective fracture roughness. So especially using the history match or production data analysis approach to estimate the fracture roughness, that might be a way to do it. But it's that, again, is only one time like uh, deal. It's a snapshot at that moment. Next moment, fracture roughness may change. Okay. But currently, with this uh, uh, the multi-stage hydraulic fracturing in the uh, horizontal well now, we are using this uh, complex fracture modeling approach. So that model actually provided lots of the fractures in different uh, clusters, different lengths, different height, different dimensions. Basically, just uh, migrate. I mean, use that results migrate directly into the reservoir uh, simulation model where we apply the, the, uh, our approach to speed up the history match. So okay. over there, we did not, we did not uh, really trying to distinguish between the hydraulic fracture length or properly fractured length. We just assuming this area or not assuming is basically from the modeling results, this area with uh, this kind of uh, concentration, you can div divide by area by proponent either conductivity or concentration uh, regions area. So that uh, we apply the different uh, the correlations so that we do not have to worry about what is exactly fracture half length at the, uh, that area, I mean, that moment. 
is just uh, use this, uh, the results from complex fracture modeling side and then apply the correlations and then started the history match. Okay, no, thanks for that clarification. I've been thinking a lot about perm reduction and I've also been told that it really depends where you are in the basin to understand the magnitude of the perm reduction. And there could be other parts of a, of a basin, for instance, and when you, think about a, when you think about a shale basin, that even stress-dependent permeability may not be applicable everywhere. And that, that's probably a controversial statement. So for a perm reduction mechanism, is it applicable in all parts of a shale basin? Like suppose if you're along the shelf versus if you're in the depot center of the basin, now that you need to be the uh, uh, clarification. Yeah, you, the question you raised is pretty good. Now, if you're talking about the matrix perm reduction, and if the, uh, so that's depend on the uh, reservoir rock or deposition uh, heavily. Some rock with very strong, very well consolidated rock, very well supported and like sandstone, or even the high strength carbonate, you may not see any uh, matrix perm reduction with stress at all, or very little. With some kind of very high clay, very high, no young module rocks, you may see it. That's my personal opinion. However, this paper is really, we are focusing more on the proton fracture permeability reduction with depletion. That's what we are doing now in the unconventional reservoir development. We're trying to mimic the fracture length or dimensions reduction with stress, with increasing stress by depletion. So it, it happened all the time everywhere for sure. That's for, for sure because the fracture conductivity, I mean, hydraulic fracture conductivity reduced with, with depletion for sure. So that's it need to be the focus on different it's a, we are focused on the hydraulic fracture conductivity reduction. Thanks for clarifying that the matrix permeability reduction versus the hydraulic, the, the propped fracture conductivity reduction. And uh, okay, yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense now because I've been thinking a lot about that and I've been hearing a lot of when to, de when to think about stress dependent permeability versus, versus not and the propped fracture conductivity reduction is pretty much applicable. Not, yeah, that's pretty much applicable everywhere. Yes, okay. indeed. Is the only thing is it could be very interesting that in, also I borrowed a publication, uh, a chart from in the, as showing the figure 23 in the paper is really kind of reflect the, the it's about the Young's modules impact on fracture conductivity if you have open fracture with a little propon, that will be very different from the uh, rock type by rock type in, in certain ways about the Young's modules. So that's why sometimes in the Eagle for example, as I gave the Young's model is very low, it's about two in the main reservoir, is too minimum or less. If you have some open fractures or has little propon there, in very beginning, you, you will see their uh, contribution to the production a lot, but with depletion, so the area is like fracture just close very fast because you apply the stress. They uh, need to be the propon already embedded into the uh, rock itself. So not the fracture just simply close. There's a uh, mass of the papers or documents already uh, for, to support that. For the, uh, in the other areas, it really depends on the, again, it depends on the rock me mechanics, I mean, rock mechanical properties to see how really the rock is, uh, what it looks like. So that's why I think you, you did need to be the study before regarding the drawdown uh, management on the well performs. That's uh, to me is really on um, that reflection is the rock itself. If it's a very uh, high young module rock, and with some problem there, if you draw down very fast, it crashes the problem and close the fracture very fast too. But it is it, so it depends on the rocks. 
in the our wolf camp or in the uh, uh, Permian basin, if you see the uh, the uh, mythology or the rocks with layers, I mean the different uh, mineral components, they have different Young's modules. Right. So that's a little bit of complication or uh, complexity when we try to do a history match because every layer of the rock behaves differently. So different. And plus the prop of the setting with gravity to the bottom of the fracture. Oh, right. That, there's always that. Yeah. Even fracture modeling is, yeah, even fracture modeling has a tough time showing that sometimes. I wanted to wrap my head around this with the fracture perm reduction model that was proposed. How does it exactly speed up the computation and calibration time? So this the thing is that is is kind of automatically right the, because the uh, for each year uh, again is by different uh, area or uh, regions we uh, we define predefine see this area is permeability or the I mean the the uh, fracture conductivity or permeability is this area is more than this we use this correlation drawdown I mean they uh, disappear very fast as uh, we uh, demonstrated in the figure 20, 20 or 22, no, let me see, uh, figure 19 and the figure, uh, those things, so because it's behave very fast, you can see this, uh, the, um, uh, in the figure 20 to 23, we demonstrated with the stress, you can see the, uh, the uh, fractures, we call this SRV, reduce with that uh, mimic very uh, very well, very fast. So, so it's basically pre-set up something like this. And we do not have to try an error to every single time we say, a transition we use just sing one single correlations in the chart, in the figure 21 or 20, is one chart, one single curve, trying to mimic everything. We knew this could happen, but you have to try a lot. And also is end up with one time sna uh, snapshot. So this one is really trying to use multiple correlations uh, corresponding to different area. And then it's automatically take care of these things. We do not have to try error many times as you did. It's history match always trying the error to change this parameter to much better or change the other parameter we can uh, much better. This way is really we just uh, we set uh, one model I mean correlation and set up the correlations and that's model run. We maybe run a couple of times, that's all. So it's uh, much faster. Thanks for that explanation, especially. Uh, and yes, history matching is definitely a trial and error and it's, uh, it's, it's fun. It's definitely, it's an exercise for sure. There was one question I wanted to, one more question I want to ask you before I let you go. And I think this is just something for the industry. What are some applications of this workflow based on what you've presented at the, the simulation conference that we have not seen before in this industry? Uh, well, I think the, the, this workflow is really a, a is the integration of the modeling process from geological modeling to complex structure modeling to the reservoir simulation model, just one place. That's number one. That's, that's the already it is there. But the, 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 the paper document need to be the practice we just found out if we, uh, we can divide the fracture area into different regions by either concentration or conductivity and then plotting multiple correlations to mimic the process of the fracture conductivity reduction with stress then we found out it's much faster, much smoother for the, uh, the uh, simulation process. That's really the need to be the tweak for the uh, everything. I think the more and more uh, the individuals are using this workflow. I think the last week when I went to a different uh, workshop, I found somebody starting to apply similar thing to, I said, well, that's good. But they only apply one or two. I think it's two. I say we, 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 we are using multiple regions, but we just simply div divide it into the different five regions or sometimes even six based upon the pumping design. 
I mean, what do I mean by that? Sometimes the uh, accomplishment may use a different prop on the size. It's like say 100 mesh mm -hmm. majority, then uh, tail in with 40, 70. Then it gave us a little bit of say, I may need to use another region for this area because that 40, 70 is stronger than 100, et cetera. So that's uh, got some idea too. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time to be on this podcast, Hongji. Oh, thank you very much for uh, the interest on this uh, paper too. Of course. Well, you heard it from Hongji, everybody. Please be sure to check out the paper 203935. And the paper description is in the description below for the podcast and for the, and for the YouTube channel. All right, viewers and listeners, this is Yoga Shri Pradhan, and I am signing off.